Hello everybody, this is Paulie D. Paul Diadamo from Rebuilders Automotive Supply. Hey, I've got a new uh, topic area that I'm covering these days, uh, QC counts. It's quality controls for cores and catalytic converters, all for you, the recycler, to maximize the profits. One thing I've recognized in the last six months as I uh, started working in the core team is that there's a huge gap between what you invoice oftentimes and what you receive for payment, and it's called deductions. My job is to help you fine tune your systems and processes to make sure that you capture all the income that you deserve. In fact, with any seminar that I do, I typically talk about behavior change. The fact of the matter is, uh, there's still a lot of old school thinking when it comes to cores. And we need to really change and reflect with the times and think about things differently. And honestly, right now with the cost of goods at the price that it is for cars and light trucks, we need to really focus on the core element of our business. Fact of the matter is, you've probably seen this slide before. I probably have it in every seminar I've done. Uh, we just can't afford to do things the way we've always done it. Uh, you either need to change people, change job, job descriptions. We need to upgrade our systems to make sure that we are paying attention to all revenue streams and making sure that we maximize each of those revenue streams. In fact, with cores, not only do I think that we are leaving money on the table, fact of the matter is we're burning it up. We actually, when you think about the time and labor we put into cores, in my opinion, we're not getting full value. And we're going to talk about all the details. So think about it this way. You may have to just think through your core process. You may have to make some incremental change, but that incremental change, in my opinion, can result in large benefits on a monthly and annual basis for your business. Throughout the last 16 months <clears throat> with COVID, I don't think there's anyone on the planet who hasn't heard of the term supply chain. Fact of the matter is, uh, you probably know that I bought, uh, my family bought Bill's Auto Parts in Cumberland, Rhode Island, 1987. And it was, or had become a hoarder's paradise, uh, a real true old school junkyard. In fact, in his day, in the 30s and 40s, that's the 1900s, uh, 1930s, 1940s, Bill was the supply chain. There were not part stores in every corner. We did not have online ordering. Guys, things have changed. We are part of the supply chain. In fact, the automobile is one of the most recyclable products on the planet, which means that it has built-in sustainability. We buy a vehicle and we extract multiple things. We primarily focus on parts. Some of you guys might focus strictly on the core metals and commodities, but <clears throat> all of these revenue streams contribute to your annual revenue. And what we need to do is focus on the cores because it is a sustainable product. We need to handle it properly and recognize that we at RAS and other core companies, and I do speak across the board because we all share the same concerns and issues. Our primary interest is to give you maximized dollar for your core products. But you have to recognize, A, that we're in a supply chain. So at RAS, when we source the automotive cores from your facilities, we then sell them to remanufacturers. We need to add reman to our vernacular. We need to think through that process. So when we are pulling cores and we're matching numbers and we're checking for quality and we're, we're thinking through the process that we are actually packing, maybe not a product for your retail and wholesale local shops, but we are literally <clears throat> identifying, picking cores, packing cores and shipping cores to be sold to a remanufacturer and the ultimate destination for those parts would be on a retailer's shelf at an AutoZone, a Pet Boys, or an O'Reilly's. <clears throat> As I started going, <coughs> excuse me, 
as I started going through the process of quality control, I recognized that, oh my goodness, there's so many aspects to this. Number one, the physical count. We wanna make sure if you're invoicing a box, yeah, there might be some extra pieces, but there shouldn't be like a wild number of extra pieces in the box. So the number of counts. Your process has everything to do about your ultimate success with your core program. Yes, there are industry standards. I'm gonna go through some of those things in, in detail. Theft prevention when it comes to catalytic converters has to be paramount. With the soaring values of catalytic converters, we can't afford to lose any product through theft. Safety, uh, particularly in the handling of catalytic converters and the physical toll it takes our employees to extract them. Ultimately, it's all about the financials. We need to make our core programs work so that we can provide a revenue stream that warrants its deployment, that we put resources to it and we make sure it's done right. The biggest thing is the part quality. We really need to look at the part quality, not only when it's pulled, not only when it's packed, but when it's received at RAS. Fact is, core companies could be your number one customer. We oftentimes call on recyclers who have, we, we see their inventory, so we know they have a fairly large quantity on hand of a particular part. In fact, it might be a special, maybe it's a rack and pinion, and we're offering like within 10, 15% of retail and yet the recycler denies us saying that, hey, well, we're saving those for our customers. Why aren't we a customer? In fact, we have recurring orders, <clears throat> virtually no returns, no warranties, consistent buy lists, and even sometimes hot lists. Why don't we get together <clears throat> and figure out how we can make this work? Because clearly having overstock on your shelves for many hundreds, maybe thousands of days on hand, does not ultimately give you cash in hand to go buy more vehicles. Your goal should be 100% ROI, but more often than not, the reports that you get, recognizing the income that RAS or other core companies are willing to give you for your product is less than. And that's what I wanna talk about today is because there's some very simple things <clears throat> that if we all paid attention, our yield on what we send in will be significantly higher. And I'm talking, and my belief is 10 to 20% easily. The focus items that I've come across are after shooting hours and hours of videos for some of our customers questioning why they invoiced X amount, but only received Y amount. And honestly, <clears throat> we're gonna go through each one of these in details, but we have to recognize when you're pulling those parts, we cannot take remand or aftermarket parts, okay? If it's aftermarket in particular, those parts are not genuine auto uh, automaker parts. Pulleys must turn. That's a simple rule, we'll go into some detail. Matching the ID number is very important. You know as well as I do, compared to the 1930s, there's a whole lot more models and a whole lot more part ID numbers. Our remanufacturing customers, when they say they want a specific number, that's what we try to stick to. Marking your stock numbers clearly, not sending parts that are busted up, pulleys, ports, plugs, and also that we have no excessive rust or burnt parts. The first item is the reman OEM. So when we get a part off a vehicle and it's an original equipment part, like a Mitsubishi compressor, we need that, all the components in that to work. So in other words, if you spin the pulley, if you pump the pumper, and otherwise than that, it's not broken, we're good to go. We're not asking you to do anything else. However, we do need to make sure that it is not <clears throat> an aftermarket AC compressor because the components that are put in there cannot match oftentimes the products that were put in the original. I got the spin rule, the Paul D spin rule. Pulleys must turn. If it's locked up, that means the components inside the unit cannot be just simply replaced and remanufactured. 
If the core has a gear or pulley, it must spin. How about matching the ID numbers? I mentioned this earlier. Most parts ha are clearly marked. It might be an etching on a caliper, or a stamping, it might be a label, but we do need to match the correct part ID numbers. Most of the software that you will use uh, will allow you the opportunity to save a search on a particular stock number of vehicle, pull those parts. In some cases, maybe you can identify it at the vehicle. Sometimes they have to be pulled, but we need to be able to match those part ID numbers. It's part of the process. If possible, at all possible, please mark the stock number clearly on the part. Very important. When we invoice or open your invoice when the product comes in, we like to match up exactly everything that you've sent to what you've invoiced. Now, that doesn't mean that if five or 10 parts have the stock number smudged or wiped off, that we will not go to the nth degree to match it. Our guys, I got to tell you, I'm always so impressed with our core check-in folks. It's not just computer power that we use and the diagrams on the screen. It's brain power and memory power. Many times these guys can identify a part from like five feet away, uh, whether it's a caliper or a brain box. Uh, so we use all those resources to validate your parts, check them in and get you payment. When it comes to broken housings, <clears throat> pulleys, <coughs> excuse me, ports or plugs, it's very important that we recognize that cores are not junk. Cores are parts that need to be resold to someone who's going to remanufacture them. So when they're busted up, alternators, uh, ribs are broken, plugs are broken, you're gonna get deductions and we really don't like doing that. A couple of recommendations, especially for your electrical parts, is save the plug and the pigtail. It kind of acts as a protector of the plug. The other thing is we actually recommend that people don't throw uh, parts into your, your Gaylords, your core boxes. That makes a big difference. And also, if possible, where there might be parts that may have residual fluids that you just use a cap plug to prevent leaking on other parts. When it comes to brain boxes, again, I can't stress enough, save the plug, cut the pigtail, that protects the plug and the pins. I was just at RAS last week up in Advanced Electronics and we have thousands of brain boxes and I was going through and the check-in and things, uh, parts that were not able to be checked in. And I saw a lot of broken plugs and pins mashed. Guys, we can't accept them. So please save the plug, leave the pigtail. When it comes to excessive rust or burnt parts, I often joke that I, I get calls every now and then from recyclers. Hey Paul, what do you consider excessive rust? My current answer is, well, if you're calling me, it's probably excessive rust. Yes, we'd like a good bleeder. Uh, we do, do need the bracket on calipers as well. Very rarely when we don't need the bracket, that's part of the assembly. Uh, missing a broken pistons, uh, rotor drags, those are all unacceptable. But excessive rust or burnt parts, honestly, you're better off just throwing them back in the junk car. Do not send them. Packing also, as it turns out, is a hot spot for damage to parts. And I've personally witnessed this where we have checked in a box only to find light duty cores. What might those be? Instrument clusters, brain boxes, literally packed in the bottom to middle part of the box. And meanwhile, alternators, starters, AC compressors, gearboxes have been literally tossed and dumped on top of those. What do you think is the residual damage for that type of action? Well, fact of the matter is, instrument clusters are very delicate. Think about ECMs, climate controls, multifunction displays, distributors, all those kinds of parts. Honestly, we need to think about a layering process. Now let's back it up a second. And this might be a big leap for some people. 
my recommendation is you get one of those cheap Home Depot racks, put it next to your Gaylords. And then even if you have multiple vendors, have three layers. So on the rack, as you're bringing the parts in and inspecting them, you can put them on those racks. And then when it's time to pack, you'll be able to pack your hard duty cores and then put a piece of cardboard. I definitely recommend cardboard in between the layers, medium duty cores, and then your light duty cores. In fact, I've seen a few recyclers take the little extra effort, minor incremental effort to actually take their instrument clusters, clusters, clusters put a small piece of bubble wrap and then put them in a box and then put that box inside the core packing box. Remember, you are shipping them over the road. So we want to prevent damage before they go in the box. And if you pack them properly, then the bumpity bump in the freight truck on the way to RAS will be minimized as well. I can't even tell you. I, I would estimate that probably 25% easily of the damage that we see in the parts are probably in how they're packed. Because I've had managers call me from stores and say, when we pulled these parts, they were in excellent shape. And then I reply, but who packed the box and how did they pack it? And usually there's crickets on the phone. We need to do quality checks from the time it's identified, pulled, packed, and then received. Let's get into catalytic converters for a moment. Guys, uh, I don't know if you recall, but this year rhodium hit $30,000 an ounce. So you know there's rhodium, there's platinum, and there's palladium in the cats. Well, at these high trading levels, damaging a catalytic converter, A, degrades the integrity of the can, which is often important in the grading process. And number two, there's a chance that the catalyst will be busted. And trust me, dust and chunks of catalyst do matter. Let's talk about cutting tools. I think every operation is a little bit different, as we all know, but I think when we're looking at cutting tools for converters, I'm not sure I can say there's one absolute solution. Some people swear by uh, sawzalls, some like the uh, super shear style, some like the guillotine style, some use cutting torches, and some use forks and engine pullers for that job. When you consider all those techniques, we probably all of us will use at least two of those. It's important to think of the ergonomics as well. If you're doing high volume and you've got employees, and I personally have witnessed converters being cut, and I can tell you, I've had a few injuries at my facility. Those edges, after they've been cut, are super sharp. They re I recommend buying a catalytic converter basket catcher. So once it's been cut, it drops in the basket. Knowing what I know about workers' comp, ergonomic soft tissue injuries are probably in the top three. So if you can prevent your guys from bending over up and down hundreds of times a week, you're going to give your employees a better working condition. It also minimizes the loss of catalyst because every time you drop a converter, stuff is falling out. Not only that, I've seen where a converter dropped and cut a power cord for a sawzall. Most of your uh, hydraulic cutters are protected with a shield, but remember those edges are very sharp. The other thing I wanna mention is marking your converters. You know, if your converters are stolen, there's nothing worse than calling law enforcement and they say, well, how do I know it's yours? And you say, um, I actually, I don't know. It wouldn't take much time to either put the initials of your company on a converter or to put a stock number and then put that uh, in a secure area where it can be protected. O2 sensors, another area for maximizing your returns. Honestly, it's a two-step process. Once the converter's out, snip the wire, and then we actually, uh, at RAS, I've seen this where we have an impact gun and they took a, um, a deep socket and they welded an extra socket because you know 
the actual uh, part of the sensor that you're unscrewing is closer to the cat. So you need an extended socket. And honestly, uh, good bang for the buck. They are, they do have some value. And over the course of several months, you could accumulate them and maybe uh, acquire enough cash and money for your winter or Christmas bonuses. When it comes to cats, uh, I've seen a wild variety of cutting techniques, which also lends itself to, if you're shipping, how many cats are you putting in your Gaylord? That all comes back to trimming. If you leave a lot of pipe, you're not gonna fit many in there. Again, incremental change. If you trim up the cats as you're pulling them down or pre-packing them, you will get more cats, more bang for the buck in your boxes. More weight, more counts, more income. Well, I've tried to keep this uh, within the 30 minute range. Looks like we're coming in under 22 minutes. I wanna thank you all. I wanna thank our sponsors at ARA. Uh, I'm gonna be giving this seminar on the road uh, in 2022, and I wish I could be with you today, but uh, I can't. So have a wonderful conference. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I hope I've been able to at least open your eyes to some incremental changes that can bring you maximum profits on your cores and your catalytic converters. Thank you very much.